Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another week of the TRG seminar series. If you managed to find us live, you did better than I did last week in terms of navigating all of the different northern and southern hemisphere time zones. So um, we thank you and appreciate you for doing that. Um, this will be uh, the new time going forward for the next few weeks. Um, if, uh, if the times have changed for you because you're in North America or if you're in Europe, then um, yeah, so just stay on the same time. It's 3.30 p.m. Pacific, um, 6.30 Eastern and uh, 11.30, I think, Greenwich Mean Time. So um, this week we have a very interesting set of guests. Um, first, I just wanna thank Tom Swan again for um, his help in producing this behind the scenes as always, as well as the Brain and Mind Center um, for their support of this seminar series. So with that in mind, I will pass the conversation over to my co-host Sally Gainsbury to uh, take us through this session today. Thank you very much, Khalil. I'm Associate Professor Sally Gainsbury. I'm Director of the University of Sydney Gambling Treatment and Research Clinic within the Brain and Mind Centre. And it's my absolute pleasure to be hosting this webinar. This is one of those topics with two amazing speakers who I know I will not have enough time to chat with because what we're talking about is the very dynamic and changing nature of self-help treatments and apps for gambling. Myself, I've been working in this space since around 2009, I think I started writing and researching on this topic, which is obviously, um, you know, before Facebook, it's before most people had very complicated smartphones. So it was really a long time ago, if we look at some of the more clunky HTML based, um, you know, web 1.0 treatment options that were available compared to what we have today. So I'm very pleased to be joined by two experts who come from really different areas. So Dr. Simone Rodder has also been working probably um, longer than me, and she did her PhD in the area of online gambling treatment. Simone is a senior lecturer at the University of Auckland, but she holds adjunct positions at Deakin University and in Turning Point, and has been heavily involved in some of Australia's foremost online gambling treatment supports and apps. And then as a pleasure, it is to also introduce Dr. Manal Jain, who joins us from the UK up late, thank you, after a 13 hour shift, because she is a junior doctor in the NHS. And she is a co-founder of one of the premier gambling apps, Recover Me. So I'm really pleased to have you both. Thank you both for, for dialing in and for putting up with us negotiating the times. Um, we did manage to get this one live, which is fantastic. So if there are any questions, please do send them through on the chat and we'll see if we can answer them all. Um, well, obviously, we're just going to have a conversation about this topic that we're all interested in and come at from different angles. But what I wanted to start is by getting both of you to tell me a little bit about what drew you or started you in this area and how over the time you have been involved, you're thinking around uh, online treatment provision or, or apps. I don't even know if treatment is necessarily the right word. I, you know, sometimes it's intervention. But if you can think, tell me about what you've learned over, over the time you've been involved. Maybe, Simone, if you could start. Thank you so much, Sally, for such a delightful introduction. Um, it, that was very nice of you. Um, I indeed have known you, I think, 20, 20 long time. So um, I guess in terms of um, I started working as a counsellor with um, uh, Counselling Online, which is an alcohol and drug service in Australia. And I probably started working there in about 2005. And that was one of the biggest and main services at that time before gambling. And I remember, um, so I was working as a counsellor and I remember being told, oh, yes, you have to do this chat. And I'm like, oh, I don't think so, I'm not doing that. And, and because I thought, how on the earth could you have any sort of personal engagement with someone via the internet? And, but over time, I was convinced that that was, um, that was something that you actually just had to learn to do and that you could reach a new cohort of people in a different way and actually do kind of different work. 
Um, and then, um, so as, as I grew from that role and uh, was involved in the uh, setup of Australia's Gambling Help Online, which was the first national online counselling program in 2008-9, and then did my PhD on that service. And so I guess my curiosity around it kind of developed from that. Um, now I, I migrated to New Zealand in 2015 and, and working with a few different apps here and I guess I've moved more from can you do it or should you do it to how do you tailor it, how do you get people to engage with the content in a different way and how do you develop content that's appropriate for apps. So it's kind of a completely different perspective now. Yeah, thank you. So um, I'd also like to say thank you. Thank you for explaining also, uh, Simone, what you've been up to. It's really great to actually be invited to, to be on such a panel with such experience. I think it's always exciting to be able to learn from people who've been in the field for a considerable amount of time and have so much wealth of experience. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm nothing close to that. I started my journey about three years ago um, and it was with two of my co-founders, so Medill and Tejas, uh, and we're junior doctors in the NHS. Uh, and our story was slightly different. I think um, as medical students, we have the privilege, I guess, of speaking to people for a huge amount of time, especially when they present to sort of primary care, psychiatric units. And when we're able to sort of engage with patients like that, you really build a good rapport and you understand sort of where they come from. And our initial sort of awareness of, of this sort of devastating addiction, I guess, came from um, a consultation that we had in primary care. And at that point, we were sort of just starting out our journey as junior doctors. We were really keen to understand what sort of things we can be recommending to um, individuals that were suffering. And uh, Tejas and I did some research back at um, Imperial College London uh, as part of a sort of final group project. And we looked at how digital tools could be really effective at sort of engaging with people, really producing that positive behaviour change. And that's where our interest sort of started. We started exploring it a little bit more. Um, and yeah, I guess we were inspired to do to do a little bit more and and to find out what what we could potentially achieve with um, these digital tools. So I think over the course of sort of the last eighteen months, for sure, everything's just been accelerated massively because of COVID. We've sort of been forced <laughs> um, in some ways to just accept technology and utilize it, and that's been incredible. I think it's really pushed us to to learn about how we can better sort of cater to people um, with digital therapy. And I think digital literacy just across the world has like skyrocketed. In my parents, for example, like they use technology, you know, considerably more than they did before. And I think that translates across everything, um, especially healthcare. So yeah, it's uh, it's been an interesting journey, although a short-lived one. <laughs> so I'm excited to hear about, you know, both of your insights and how we can do more and do better over here in the UK, I guess. Yeah, and definitely I think that's one of the exciting things. When I was doing my first reviews back um, back in the day, the app didn't really matter where the apps were based, but it did matter if they disappeared and there was a lot of things kind of popping up, disappearing, commercial, then folding, and it provides a really disjointed experience, obviously, for anyone who's seeking help. And potentially there was a lot of, it was a lot of emphasis on things like peer support forums and chat-based stuff because that was sort of how people connected back then. Um, and now fast forward and I'm in the position of director. I've come through as a, as I'm a trained clinician, a clinical psychologist, but I've primarily been in research. So looking at this from, from both sides. And at the University of Sydney Gambling Treatment Clinic, we were given the remit of developing an equivalent online for face-to-face. -face. So we have a, um, an expert senior clinician, Fadi Anjul, who developed um, essentially a model of online therapy that would be equivalent to face-to-face, -to -face, which is fantastic. And it's, um, we're in the process of doing an RCT on it. But then as I'm looking at our stepped care approach, I'm thinking, this doesn't actually meet all the needs because some of the really benefits of online overcoming the barriers of people who aren't necessarily ready 
for a fully intensive equivalent to face to face and it's some of the barriers are you know you just can't get there or you can't attend at time and it's a kind of convenience to do it online but some of the barriers are you, you're just not ready or you might not need the equivalent of a full cbt loan program and that what we really need is something that can meet meet that need of someone who's maybe looking to find out a bit more or has lower or less complicated problems or just something kind of as a step you know a lower intensity step into potentially something more detailed and so I'm sort of looking around and saying it's actually not just one solution. We need a lot of different products. There's not one size fits all. And that's before you even start thinking about diversifying for, you know, cultural background and gender and linguistics and type of gambling and all that other stuff. So I know, Simone, you've been also, you've worked on lots of different types of interventions and programs. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about your thoughts of, of what are the different solutions, treatments, interventions that are appropriate and what's out there. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. I, I think of something to come back to is about the funding and ongoing funding that you raised at the start of that too, Sally. Um, but in terms of the um, stepped care approach, unfortunately, what seems to have happened in the last few years is that we've developed these CBT packages that take a long time to develop and are based on you know what was done in person or face to face, and then we've said, well, we'll cut that back for people with low you know low levels of gambling problems or moderate or even you know, problem gambling, but, you know, that are just behaviourally conditioned, or not just, but behaviourally conditioned without the other um, comorbidities. And what happens is they don't do the program. So they start, they might do one or two modules, and then they go if they do that. And there's a lot of evidence now to suggest that they're not fit for purpose. So I know um, John Cunningham's group in, and David Hodgins in Canada have, have run a number of trials recently where they've delivered um, what would normally be delivered to people with problem gambling to lower risk um, populations. And they don't, they don't find any effect. And the same with um, the French studies where they delivered them to non-help seekers um, in a big randomised trial. Again, no effect, mainly because of the dropout with that one. So it really starts to speak to tailoring things according to what we're trying to do rather than shrinking things by what we want to do. I don't know what you, you're, you're nodding, uh, whether you, what you think about that too, um, Linnell. So we think that's um, spot on actually. That's what we found as well throughout our journey. It's about engaging the right sorts of users. Um, but equally, what we think is super important is patient choice. And, and that sort of translates across the the sphere when we're seeing people in primary care for things like depression for anxiety we're able to offer them a, mul a multitude of options um, of receiving that treatment and I think in the NHS what we do we do the step care you know the step care model so the initial um, IAPT which is the improving access to psychological therapies that can take the form of sort of digital tools or sort of face-to-face -face. Um, and then you know if they really need further intensive uh, programs we can direct them to specialist centres, uh, tertiary care centres that can offer that. Um, but what we feel that we can achieve with the digital tools is getting people into that treatment pathway. So I think you mentioned it, Sally, just that increased awareness, the insight. And what's been really interesting with our app is we're able to collect you know, real-time data. And what we found actually is a number of people who gamble um, sort of sporadically, intensive, uh, intensively, have sort of spent a lot of money spent a lot of time and then come straight onto the app so they almost have this feeling that you know, they need to do something about it and they want to act instantaneously so a number of our diary entries have been quite interesting because we found that individuals have had that sort of moment where you know they want to seek help and they want to do that quickly and that sort of brought them onto the app um which has been really exciting actually because then what we're able to do is is offer them the patient choice if we can't deal with um that sort of holistic if we can't deal with them holistically and they have a number of other co comorbidities we can potentially sort of send them to the right the right people or the right organizations so um yeah that's what we found through through what we've been doing but i think you're right there's a lot of work to do uh to be able to direct the right sort of tools to the right sort of people what I wonder, and, um, you know, this is something that particularly, well, I, to my knowledge, happens pretty much in every country that funds gambling services, is the focus is on funneling people into treatment. 
And we have an opportunity to provide early intervention through these um, means that isn't about putting people into treatment. It's about helping people sort their problems out or their, their, you know, gambling intensity or the amount they're spending before they get anywhere near a treatment service. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what you guys think about that or how we, we talk about that. Yeah, definitely. So as you know, I do a lot of work on prevention and part of what I'm doing using technology is identification, algorithms, observations, looking at identifying people, whether it's through venues or online operators, or even we're looking now talking with banks and financial institutions, picking up problems before they be, get to that really crunchy, serious point, even well before when you would get treatment, you know, before you get to um, having really severe problems. And what the issue is now is that's great okay, if we identify people, what, what do we do? What, what do you suggest people, you know, it's not appropriate potentially to self-exclude. You haven't had a full-blown problem. Um, we can't send you to treatment because you don't want to go when you don't need to go. So there's these increasing stigma and barriers about, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to engage with limit setting or timeouts because I'm not a problem gambler. And there is nothing for those no. people to say, maybe learn some more. Um, at the moment we're saying, we'll just set a limit. You know, that's just like an external control. But often these limits aren't very effective anyway because they're only with one site and you can go somewhere else. So what we really need, and that's what I've identified in our, our clinical offering as well, is what do we create for people? Is it something based around motivational interviewing? Is it something that's more psychoeducational, that's about understanding, particularly around um, things like slot machines and the chances of winning, challenging those irrational thoughts before they become entrenched and really drive behaviour? Um, is it around, I know there's some apps around surfing urges or being more mindful um, maybe Manal, if you can tell us about, because I know that Recover Me has a number of different at, sort of, I don't know what you call them, at, activities or interventions, how you um, decided on those as being the suitable ones to include? No, definitely. So I think um, you're right. It's about sort of catering to the right sorts of people. So I think what we found has been particularly effective is some of the collaborations that we've made. Um, are within the education and prevention space. And we've tried to partner with organizations to really increase the awareness of gambling. Cause I think that is a society problem rather than a, like a specific sector problem. So we've, from, for our understanding, and obviously it's still very sort of initial, um, we feel like if we're able to increase that awareness, we can then identify the problem um, a bit sooner. And coming from the healthcare space, I can put my hand up and say we are notoriously bad um, as sort of medical doctors at identifying these individuals in primary care, let alone sort of psychiatric care. I've, I've talked to a number of psychiatrists and GPs who just wouldn't know where to go and how to go about recommending treatment. So I think that's definitely a big thing that we're trying to work with other organisations for. In terms of the app, yes, we do... Um, we do have a number of different components to the app. So the first of which is the actual CBT. So um, that's a structured program. We deliver about six sessions in very sort of um, flexible chunks. So we've tried to keep it as um, sort of limited. We, we don't want to overload individuals. So we've done that through audio recordings and interactive exercises just to reinforce what they're listening to. But at the same time, we've tried to incorporate things like mindfulness and the edge surfing you actually mentioned, because what we found is um, overall, there are a lot of people who are relying on this. And as a way of sort of managing emotions. And that really came out through the people that we were speaking to, the lived experience. And that was the fact that emotions are so heavily sort of involved when it comes to gambling and if we can sort of provide them with an alternative strategy to manage those emotions like mindfulness then maybe we can sort of push them towards um, better understanding and better coping strategies so so that's part of uh, what we offer as well we have the SOS tab which is sort of our unique take on the acute phase of the the addiction so when individuals are having urges or lapses we've developed mnemonics that they can sort of work through as a logical sequence of steps rather than sort of acting impulsively which we found that a Number of individuals feel like they do um, when they have those sort of acute phases. Um, 
And then the other components of the app include sort of the support forum. So just other places that they can go to for help, uh, whether that's gambling related or the other places, like you said, this finance, uh, financial sector and, um, you know, other support that is a little bit more holistic. Uh, and then we've got the diary, which is the self-monitoring part. And that's what we found really brings people onto our app um because we're able to sort of send them quite frequent notifications uh, provided they've allowed for that um to to basically engage with them on a on a frequent basis just to bring them back onto the app and hopefully encourage them to utilize other features so in a nutshell those are the sorts of five components we've tried to utilize to address different aspects of the addiction that we've identified Yeah, that sounds really useful. And I, I don't think you've had any formal evaluation yet, have you? But I, I think, and I'm sort of coming at looking at uh, research clinical, obviously we need to do best practice. Mine, you've been really involved in, in evaluations and developing best practice, which is fantastic. But again, it, as you know, it takes a long time. It costs a lot of money. You need a lot of support. Um, and then often by the time, like three, four years later, it's all well, it's sort of outdated. You need to update it or revamp it, um, you know, it's, is it still suitable for a changing dynamic population? And I'm also struggling with the idea of what's the appropriate control group? Do you, and particularly Manal, as you mentioned, customer choice has been really important, which is the antithesis of a randomized control trial where you literally randomly put people into boxes and say, you do this one and see how that works out for you. Um, and then, you know, it's not really ethical for us to put people on a wait list if they're seeking help. So how do we actually, what's the appropriate evaluation? Is it, um, you know, randomized control trials, which are obviously very scientifically robust? Is it a wait list control condition? Or is it here are the like different apps or different treatments that are available? Because we also don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's no need for every single clinic to come up with its own specific treatment, particularly when government funding has gone into a lot of these. Um, do we say, here's the different options, pick one and then we'll just send you some surveys and see see how you go and try and find a control group. Um, and, and is the comparison compared to face-to-face? -face? Is it compared to doing nothing? I mean, Simone, you've had your head in the research world of this. How do you, you know, conceptualise or think what is best practice when it comes to evaluation? Yeah, it's a really tricky one um, that I really grapple with, having been a clinician, that I really don't like giving people nothing. And that it really makes my life difficult to think about doing that um so yeah I guess we use waitlist controls now a bit but it's still not very satisfactory I guess um when you look at the the trials that have been done in the last five or so years they all pretty much generally say that you know content delivered by smartphone app is effective as you say Sally but one of the problems is when you look into the detail of those studies, often people never even access the app. And yet we're saying that it was effective. So, you know, it goes back to the same problems we've had for 20 years is that it might not be the treatment. It might be the act of downloading the app that is the treatment, which is a bit of a worry because why bother to go to all the trouble of developing this? Um, I guess an answer to that is um, in New Zealand, there was a big RCT with um, the helpline here. They had 450 people in that RCT. And um, basically what that found was that people uh, needed the treatment that they thought they would need, essentially. Um, and so if they thought they needed in-person treatment, that was what was going to work for them. Um, so, yeah, so I guess... Um, one, uh, I guess coming back to your question, though, an interesting design that we're, we're almost about to put into the field is using a micro-randomised trial design. And so basically what that does, it's an in-the-moment support. Um, the app does in-the-moment assessments and interventions. And the randomization basically happens every time the person is eligible for an intervention. So let's say that they are having a gambling urge. At that point, they get randomised to receive the treatment or not receive the treatment, which also is a bit mean, really. But in terms of what the um, health field is doing more broadly with um, trial design, it looks like um, using this, you're able to look at the active ingredient or the component of the intervention that is actually doing something as opposed to the act doing something, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's, I think that's a really interesting point because a lot of the evaluations, they say this is you know the outcome after seven weeks of just use, using the tool, but you don't look at, well, but there was maybe 12 features to that tool, which which was um, the most useful. So Manali, I know you guys obviously, and that's why it's the really interesting part of having you here is because you're you're working with the developers and you're updating, you're refining, you're kind of really in the process of creating um, your version of this app. So how are you finding engagement? What are you learning? How are you tweaking? What's the process like? And what, what are the outcomes so far that you're learning about? So I think you both raised um, really valid points. It's what we found particularly difficult is, um, is being able to, to be completely satisfied with the end product to then be able to sort of take it to these trials, which are obviously extensive, you know, money, time, and um, all those different factors can then have such a bearing. And by the, by the time you're sort of there, so much has already changed. So we're trying to keep it as sort of dynamic as possible. We're iterating at every sort of chance we get. So we had version one, which was released. Well, it wasn't released. Um, publicly it was to um, a small group of lived experience individuals that we'd um, informally you know put together they were able to provide sort of feedback based on content based on design um, and we actually completely changed what we were offering I mean we were called bet on me back in the day um, and we found things like uh, trigger words like bet for example that were coming in through not only lived experience but from psychologists from psychiatrists and that was a real pushback and we you know at that point we're deciding okay we can change our name what more do we need to do and in fact a lot <laughs> we found that our interface was very boring and um, the colors that we were using using for some people were quite unpleasant they they didn't really enjoy the experience and there was a bit of um uh different sort of opinions on the content so word utilization or how long the sessions were and also whether we were addressing all the different components so we found that we were actually bringing on a new session so session six really looks at the emotional um side of things which was something that we you know really overlooked so what we've tried to do is keep a group of individuals so lived experience individuals psychiatrists and psychologists at hand um, and we've iterated the app sort of a number of times and obviously everything that we've delivered through the app is based on research so CBT at the moment is a uh, I, you know, based on what we've been reading and, and the discussions we've had with Dr. Henrietta Bowden-Jones down in London is the most effective sort of treatment. And what we've then tried to do is build out separate functionality from it. Our ideal is to be able to sort of um, assess it and, and look at the real effectiveness. And we've talked to people about it, but what we're finding is, and I please, you know, it would be great to hear your thoughts on this, someone doesn't just use the app um, or, or doesn't just use an intervention like this. They might have blocking transactions in their bank account. They might have sort of downloaded Gamban software to stop them from utilizing um, these tools which provide that physical barrier. So then it comes down to what is actually stopping them from gambling? Is, is it these physical barriers or is it utilizing this app? So what we really want to be looking at is our is our app able to manage this addiction better? So we're not saying, look, you, you'll be gamble free by the end of this app because you might not be, but are you able to reduce the gambling severity or are you, or do you feel like you have the ability to, to manage things better? And that's what we're really working on with these uh, iterations. So yeah, but it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts as to what you think is a valid question we need to be asking when people come onto a platform like this. definitely um and it's tricky because for some people the word recovery is going to be a turn off as well oh i don't need to recover from anything there's nothing you know that there's not something wrong with me and that for some people that's a very legitimate um response as well so i think you know the, the terminology the colors uh one thing i've definitely learned is it's very difficult to please everyone and if you do get a product that doesn't offend anyone it usually doesn't work because it's just so watered <laughs> down that it has has no impact whatsoever uh, we've done some fun fun sort of just messaging let alone a whole app we've tried to create sort of 12 words that is, are effective in you know getting people to prompt a reaction and the people either love them or hate them or don't give two hoots about them so it's a really complex um, job that you're both trying to trying to tackle. Um, Simone, wh what are your thoughts in response to that? Yeah, um, I guess I guess one of the things that um, Manal, you you prompted me to think, and Sally, was that 
there perhaps is a difference between an app that's developed to um, test the efficacy for research and um, what that app looks like when it's delivered as part of a service delivery. Um, and so one of the, you know, that's one of the big differences that I've noticed in my work that when um, working with services, the questionnaires don't look the same, the screening tools don't, the words can't look the same because what we put in research projects actually makes no sense often to people that fill them out or the clinicians. Um, and so like one project at the moment, the screening tool is, is so much adapted that it actually needs to be tested again as a screening tool. But you couldn't deliver it as a self-directed tool and, and legitimately think people can understand and respond to it. Um, and so it, it, um, I think when we're developing them as research projects, we need to be really mindful of having a theoretical base and not hanging all the tinsel and things onto the app because we think people might like it, which I think is the difference when you're delivering it, you know, as part of a, you know, a service delivery part, that you can put all these things on that you think will help people. But when we're testing if it's uh, if it if it works as intended, it, I think it has to stick quite closely to the theory that it's supposed to be built on. I don't know what you're, you're nodding your head. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, that's I think that's where and where we've started looking at again some of the original apps is they had no tinsel. There was it was like a kind of a grey screen with text on it with like the interactive parts were selecting boxes and a box would open up. So um compared to fast forward now where if it doesn't have animations and you know professionally developed videos with multicultural people in them. But by the time you've developed all that stuff you're then testing the bells and whistles a little bit and you've gone away from well is it is it just that but but on the flip side if it's not engaging and people don't use it, then it doesn't work either. So it kind of gets back to you need both, but you can't test them both at the same time. Um, you know, what what is best practice? And is it maybe, you know, Manal's approach of let's develop it and iterate it based on what people are telling us. And at the end of the day, it's effective if people keep using it, then that's not really the worst outcome in the world either. No, but I think that you, um, what you're saying too, Sally, though, is that we have, I mean, and you're in an in interesting position being in a, a basic a type of service delivery and university in that you have to balance the fact that you want to do a pure research, but you also want to deliver it. So when I'm talking about tinsel, I'm talking about all the CBT stuff that people put in things that aren't necessarily, like CBT is not a theory, if you're thinking about what the theory is that is delivering it. So... For example, one of the things that um, I've been working on is self-help strategies from the opposite view to behaviour change techniques. So behaviour change techniques being the MISHI work in the UK that talks about the, the smallest ingredients of change that are in interventions and that when you're writing up what an inter what's in the intervention, it should be aligned with these BCTs, of which there's at least 100 of them. Um, and so interestingly, they have an app of BCTs that has a section that if you want to deliver um, a, a package based on this theory, these are the sorts of BCTs you would have in it if you're wanting to deliver something and et cetera. And they've got about 10 different theories that then links the BCTs of what t ingredients you would put in your package. And that's really not how gambling research happens. We put lattices and um and probably alex's early work like anyone that's written a book and then they kind of end up in the cbt packages and we don't really know which part of that works definitely manal look again i mean coming from a, a practitioner point of view how like what's your process of of checking in i love that you're using lived experiences and psychiatrists as well, because I certainly think that consumer feedback is really useful. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how your your process is developing and what which tools are, are more or less useful. I mean, what what's your experience telling you? So I guess from from our perspective as well, when we released the app, one of our main goals was obviously to be as safe as possible. I mean, coming from the space that we do, we recognise the severity of the addiction as well. So we looked at sort of independent bodies that could potentially evaluate the app. So within the UK, we have Okra um, and they're sort of an independent um, organisation that I think look at about 
250 elements of the app so sort of accessibility um how much of it is sort of based on research or effective uh, how, how effective it could potentially be based on everything that exists in the sphere um and you know we did quite well on that and, and to, to us that was quite promising and reassuring um because we felt like what we were then putting out although there wasn't sort of an rct to, to back it um it was still significant enough to be able to offer someone some benefit um, out there. And I think what we've sort of learned through the process is that the way we're developing the app seems to be having a good response with the users that we have. So we have about 830 users on our platform at the moment. So they've all created um, accounts and I'd say about sort of 60 percent but we're still defining exactly what an active user is um if I'm completely honest and it is a learning process from from our perspective as well but features that we found to be particularly useful or particularly used are the um self-monitoring diary 100 percent we've had some really good um inputs on that and people are really really honest which is great and they have a lot of insight actually when when they're provoked and, and when they're asked these um these questions and that gives us a lot of um information and what we hope to do with that information obviously is to then again, like I've been saying, the iteration, so basically change the app to, to suit their needs. Um, we've also had a number of users utilize the mindfulness aspect more than we actually anticipated, which is also quite exciting. Um, we feel that's probably because people are using it just generally, Headspace, Calm, um, th those are really common apps there right, right now too. And then what we found with the CBT is, and this is a learning process for us too, um, some users, get onto our platform complete session one a lot quicker than we thought they would. Um, and then maybe there's a bit of a delay um, and then they come back to CBT sort of session two in you know a week or so. And, and we're at the moment trying to understand that a little bit better. So do we lock sessions? Do we um, provide them with um, a bit more time? Um, so w that's still a sort of a learning process. But I'd say for, from our research, the, the self-monitoring diary and the mindfulness is where we're really going to focus our energy for the next sort of few months. And I wonder about that. Um, you raised um, a really good point about the timing. And it reminds me that what I've noticed over the last period is we tend to anchor everything in in-person services and um, build apps that reflect what we think works face-to-face -face rather than what we think would work in an app. Um, and so I, I was always struck by, um, I remember, you know, I, I like games that are addictive and I'm, you know, always looking for articles on the most addictive games. And, um, you know, and I read some articles saying, look, you know, if we hadn't had in-person games before touch screens, we wouldn't be playing these games that don't work very well with touch screens. And I thought, yeah, that's about the same with treatment too. We probably wouldn't be doing a lot of what we were doing if we weren't anchoring ourselves in face-to-face -face treatment. So my point is, was about um, um, something picking up on what you said about the timing. I mean, it takes people 10 years to develop a gambling problem, but we give them six weeks to recover. And to me, that makes no sense. Um, with online platforms, we can have it so that it's delivered over one or two years. Or, you know, like we can think differently about how we're supporting people. And um, the other thing, I guess, related to that is we also like um, deliver things once online and think that that's going to change the person's thinking about something. So we might have an activity on um, uh, illusion of control, maybe one or two activities and think that that's going to sort that out. When in practice, that's not really how it works. So I guess like I feel like we're only at the start of being able to use the technology. Um, yeah. Oh, definitely. And I was going to ask Manal, um, I'm really interested in how your users come to you because often if you're doing something as an RCT, well, the plus side is you get to pay people. <laughs> so essentially you say, we'll give you, you know, and you have to be really careful about pain and gambling and, you know, what how that all works. Um, but you can, you know, incentivize or you put ads up um, or you can go through this as part of the treatment um, service. But um, so how do people find Recover Me? 
So that's uh, that's really interesting as well. And I think um, the best part of what we're doing at the moment is a lot of trial and error. Um, and what we've really found is looking at different sort of organizations and looking at this addiction sort of um, from a different point of view and, and really looking at what the pathway to treat, especially in the UK, what the pathway to treatment is um, and where are people presenting so when we first started these conversations I think we were a bit narrow-minded I guess we were coming from the healthcare space and we were thinking oh you know a GP can ask that question and that's absolutely fine but what we found actually is that not everyone goes to their GP that's not what they think they should be doing so we've had people presenting to the Citizens Advice Bureau for financial help people reaching out to banking um, organizations especially in the UK we've had Monzo we've now had the likes of sort of HS SBC, Lloyd's really incorporating things like Gamban, Gamcare within their own sort of space and having face to face conversations in a bank, which is amazing. Um, and then we've had, um, you know, just general sort of charities where people are going to for help. Um, so what we've tried to do is our strategy is really look at building that awareness and looking at where people are presenting. So one exciting sort of project that we've had and this is what was closely linked to our launch was partnering up with Southampton Football Club so they're a Premier League football club um sports betting was sort of in the media at the time there was a lot of backlash for these uh football clubs about the exposure that people are having um to gambling sort of through football shirts through gambling ads during the game and even just during the game when you know you've got your led lights saying bet three six five or um all the other sort of gambling operators um and we actually had a really good uptake uh from people in southampton um which you know was really interesting because we could see that there was a massive link to to sort of becoming aware and whether it was the intrigue that was bringing them onto the platform or whether it was just the recognition that oh wait maybe there is something that I need to explore here so we we had our partnership with Southampton then that followed on with Watford Football Club as well we were able to partner with the education and prevention company Epic Risk Management um so when they hold their workshops they have um some signposting opportunities and we're part of that opportunity as well we're also engaging with other education and prevention um organizations because I, I don't know what it's like over there but right now in the UK there's a massive push to to really bring this into schools into universities and we think that's a really good opportunity to just you know mention the name um and, and see where you know and what happens with that um the other thing that we found is um the NHS so that's really exciting for us we're just in the, in the process of developing that relationship a little bit more but that looks to be quite a promising area and I think something that what something that we found as well is and this is what we've sort of talked about already is, is the the flexible nature of this app is it too flexible and do we need to have an element of face-to-face -face? does there need to be sort of a, a complementary um therapy and that's what we're really looking at at the moment so whether we blend this to a face-to-face -face, so you're, you're utilizing the app you're using that on a daily basis and then when you see your face-to-face -face counselor or your face-to-face -face CBT therapist they can then go back to the app and say oh okay let's use this as our point of reference and let, let's build on it from that so um yeah so I, I guess that's uh, a little bit about what we're doing um it'd be great to hear your thoughts to see whether there are other opportunities that we need to be looking at other areas that we need to be focusing our energies on to to actually explore building this awareness further Simone how does that compare to how you've recruited people in or where people yeah I mean from? Yeah, no, that's an amazing recruitment strategy. Hats off to you. That is really, you know, impressive. Um, never done anything as extensive as that. It's really impressive. Um, I guess one of the things that it prompted me to think about was um, we often spend our recruitment energy targeting new help seekers when, um, you know, some research like um, Sally, your interactive research a few years ago when you asked um, online gamblers if they had ever used, you know, 10 or 12, you know, 10 different service types, 
it was actually around 50% of people had spoken to someone before about their gambling if they had a problem. And so um, well, I think, you know, it's fairly common to try and get those new ones, but we don't really do much about trying to re-engage people and we don't really even have any sort of much thinking, I'd think, about that, about how you would even go about re-engaging people that have previously talked to someone. So I think that's sort of an area and also around relapse prevention as well that, um, you know, at the, at the moment relapse prevention apps are generally delivered for new help seekers as well instead of, you know, post-treatment. There's a few doing post-treatment but not that many, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point and we often get that sort of headline stat that 90% of people with gambling problems don't seek help but then if you couple that with David Hodgins' work that, well, you know, 90% of those people don't need help. They spontaneously, you know, recover or resolve that problem that it, it, it undermines a lot of that focus on trying to get these. We've got, you know, we have these national surveys and they have these just awful stats about how many people have problems and don't seek help or don't know they have a problem. But I think obviously you have to keep, and that's what I think is nice about us having this conversation is we also speak to the clinical people and we see those populations. So a lot of the work um, in concert of what I'm trying to develop as, as the gambling treatment clinic at University of Sydney evolves and we're about to start a whole new service offering, which is super exciting, super daunting, but provides me with the opportunity to kind of start from scratch in my new role is looking at kind of two aspects. And one is going out in the community, um, but we're not necessarily just targeting people in the community. What I want to do is try and increase awareness and training in the whole sector. So, um, you know, financial counsellors, GPs, nurses, psychiatrists, legal aid, welfare, because as you say, Simone, over those 10 years, someone's developing a problem. At some point, they're talking to someone and they might not be talking about gambling, they might be talking about anxiety or not sleeping or finance or legal or something else that's going on. And if any of those services providers are saying at any point, do you gamble as like a one question screening item and then have, okay, here's a referral, like not taking on the mantle of having to do a full screening and identification, but the greater awareness we have and the ability to make appropriate referrals, even if it's just a one step, um, amongst those professionals, I think we'll start to get people. And then the other is obviously when we're working with industry and developing up their tools is having some options available other than just set a limit. So that's one piece. But then the other is this stepped care that, I mean, we've found really difficult time for our, we're doing some piloting of our RCT recruitment and people call it up and say, okay, I'm ready for face-to-face. -face. That's a major step for someone. That's, that's huge. And then for us to say, oh, do you want online? And they're like, no, I, I've decided I need face to face. <laughs> I don't I don't want online. Like so it's you know, it's not targeting the right population. So I think we need to really think about that strategy, but also not to reinvent the wheel because there's so many organizations out there that do really great awareness. Um, in New South Wales, the Office of Responsible Gambling are really active and supportive in, you know, doing similar things, partnerships with sporting organizations. So I think it's for me, I'm looking at how do we actually reduce the friction, increase scalability and look at, well, can we just start providing Recover Me in Australia? And like, does every country need its own national online gambling help? Or can we, can we tap into these resources? I'm talking to people over in Canada and looking at how can we bring resources together, scale, um, make things appropriate? Um, I, don't, I don't know either of you what your thoughts are about kind of sharing and globalisation of this area. Yeah, I have strong thoughts on that. <laughs> This has been a conversation for about 10 years, and especially with Canada and people that used to work with Canada. Um, look, I think, I think it almost comes back to Manal's work before about recruitment, that really anybody can build an app. That, I mean, that's the bottom line. The, the skill of the app perhaps is then what you do with it. So in some ways I'm agreeing with you, but in other ways I'm disagreeing as well, Sally, because I think that I can build a better app than other people in terms of how do you tailor it, how can you get people to engage with it, and how can you keep it on a person's phone for more than a week. So when you look at alcohol, um, there was a, um, a, 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 the big study done in the UK on alcohol apps, and within seven days, 90% of people had uninstalled it from their phone. And so 
there is a real skill in cracking that how do you get people to keep using it and it sounds like Republic of Me is one of those apps though that is getting people to keep using it so I don't know like I think it's like saying well why don't we just have one face-to-face -face service that's done through video counselling and just offer that all over the world oh well why don't we only teach one psychology undergraduate course and have that everywhere we don't we don't do that so that would be some of my views <laughs> That's um, actually really interesting. And I, th I think it's a fair point. I think what we're trying to develop is obviously something where we're coming from the UK, we understand the system, we understand the population, probably. And I guess within our team, and some of the people that we've spoken to, there is some um, diversity. And that's what we're trying to, to bring to the app as well. Um, we have actually looked at potentially taking this to, to other countries, but we do understand that there are probably some barriers and and a lot of that can come from not only the population but also the system and understanding how that works and and the sort of the the data and the information that we already have in those places so I think patient choice is massive and I think what what we're able to do with an app like this is to prompt and encourage other areas to do similar things. And I think sharing of information is definitely needed. I think from where we're coming from, um, you know, we want to know, uh, want to know more about um, how things are working in other countries in terms of digital offerings within the UK. I think, um, CCBT to so computerized CBT is a very very sort of new um then you've got the apps like recover me you've got gambling therapy that has definitely been around a little bit longer and that is obviously quite global um but it's about working together because I think like you said these apps will work slightly differently for different people um and sort of those learnings will be quite valuable. And I think it's exciting because hearing about what you guys have achieved over a, sort of across the, across the world, um, there is actually a big, and it's, it's quite new to me as well, that there's quite a lot of movement in that space. So it would be sort of valuable to hear about your lessons, Simone, you know, what, what we can do to, to make things better. But I think by having more apps, we're going to sort of stimulate better treatment options, if, if that makes sense. It sort of encourages us to, to do better, to incorporate more and, and to bring that on. So I think apps are definitely scalable. We can um, take that further, but it would be interesting to see what else sort of comes out over the next sort of few months, few years. Um, yeah, that's probably. So I also think about like, if, even if you, you know, I'm notoriously with my fitness power, then you know, five other apps that do the same thing, you know, and at one point I probably had 30 of them and now I'm down to about five. I mean, people do that. They don't just have one app to do that. They have a lot of usually, yeah. Whereas I get the other way, I get paralysed by choice. So I'll always start with, you know, reviewing 10 different websites that review 10 different apps and then I get like, oh, there's, there's I have to try all of them because I want to know which is the, the best one. So a you know, myriad of choice can... Um, cause paralysis as well particularly from from a from coming from a treatment point of view I'm thinking well if we want to start um, recommending apps like that's a really tricky thing to do to say any kind of level of endorsement um, or recommendation and even if you kind of just say we're not recommending we're just providing links like there is some sort of you know, implicit endorsement in listing anything so it's really important to look at quality control and stability um, you know, things like emergencies, suicidality, there's so many complexities that you want to make sure are there, um, as opposed to just providing like a shopping list of these are just available, you go and figure it out as a consumer, you have to be really careful about, um, you know, the credibility and who provides them and where the, where the funding's from, um, you know, all these things. So, I, I feel like this has been such an interesting conversation, I so appreciate both of you, I don't know I've resolved anything or I've gotten any, I think if I was hoping for any answers in my head, but I know who to come to with all my questions um, going forward. Um, we've only got a few minutes left. I haven't left much time, but I want to give both of you a chance to say any any final words, maybe any any wish lists you have if you had, you know, grant funding or could do anything in the next, you know, two years, what would it be? I think um, perhaps picking up on the grant funding is the, you know, something you raised right at the start, Sally, is um, the, I think that's the, the biggest hurdle. And 
So if you look at, we mentioned earlier about the early intervention or the prevention work that's being done with online gambling providers, they're very sophisticated, that work being done with online gambling providers because they leverage that existing technology. But when you're building an app for a treatment service, you usually don't have existing technology to leverage. And so they're very, really expensive. And then the funder typically funds them for a particular period of time if it's an evaluation. And then those apps, as you said, disappear or you've got to try and get some funding to keep it going. So I think thinking, you know, as a, you know, maybe nationally or within the countries about how these things are supported longer term is, is something we're, we're heading towards, I reckon. That's, um, that's a very good point, actually. I think where we stand at the moment, and just to touch on that grant funding um, aspect, is Recover Me really started as a passion project for the three of us, so me, Tejas, and Dill. And we're really proud to say that sort of the version that we were able to release was a self-funded project completely. I mean, we poured, our, poured a lot of our sort of time, effort, but also our finances, because we really felt like this was something that where where we could really leave a mark and that's why what we've tried to do is you know keep this app free for the end user we're in the, we're at the stage where we're trying to integrate this within the national health service but also within other service providers as well so we really hope that sort of the attraction to digital services continues I, I i'd hate to see sort of after covid dies down we sort of go back to what we know and what we're comfortable with i think it's really pushed us to embrace technology and i'm really hopeful that sort of going forward we're able to sort of take that in our stride and and really get to the bottom of this because i think there's a lot of sort of potential with this but like we've probably discussed on the webinar, there's still so much more to learn as well. So um, I think it's a really exciting field. And I'd love to speak to you both more, you know, after this webinar's over, um, just to hear more about sort of your thoughts, your experiences and how we can sort of work together as well. Because I think collaboration is great and um, we're really seeing it in the UK. So to be able to do that internationally, that would be incredible. Yeah, I do think that's one of the great things about the field is that um, the gambling field is small enough that, you know, but between us, we probably do know most of the people working in this particular space in gambling. So hopefully collaboration. I certainly know that's something I've really been looking at. How can we leverage um, all the brains and the work that's gone on without starting from scratch ourselves? So, look, I really want to thank you, Manal. I've come off a long shift working and then jumped on a webinar. Simone's hopped on from Auckland. Uh, thank you both so much for such an interesting conversation. Uh, if anyone watching wants to follow up with anyone, you can, I'm sure, track down the details on LinkedIn or elsewhere. Where, uh, and certainly we will keep this conversation going. And I uh, thank you all who, who joined in live as well. And for everyone who's listening after the fact, please feel free to send through any comments via email or, or LinkedIn. Um, a huge thank you again. And I'll hand over to Khalil now. Thank you, Sally. That was, uh, again, an awesome seminar and uh, really interesting and fascinating. It's just, it's great to see the other side of technology when um, we're bombarded with, you know, so much uh, news coverage around the ways the technology is being used to for us to gamble in different new places and new ways. It's it's great to see um, that there's another side to that coin as well. Uh, so uh, thank you both for your talk um, as well. Thank you, Sally, for uh, moderating the session. Uh, next week we have another interesting session that's going to cover um, a topic that we've talked about previously, but this is going to be in a different way. We're going to be talking about AI in the context of what's actually happening inside of organizations um, as far as using it to identify uh, risk levels within um, player bases through player data. And to do that, we have two speakers. One is making her third appearance on the seminar series, Sasha Callahan from the University of Sydney very popular speaker that we've had previously and that we've invited back. And then also uh, joining Sasha will be Michael Auer from Necton Limited, uh, one of the companies that's actually been a, a major supplier and service provider to gaming organizations around AI-based tools for responsible gambling. So we're really excited to have both of them on. 
But that's all we have for this week. Um, we look forward to seeing everybody next week. Hopefully uh, you were able to find this live if you wanted to watch it live, but if not, I'm sure you're watching the recording right now and, and are enjoying it just as much as I did. So uh, that's all for today.